So you're at the gym and you're doing your normal bench pressing or shoulder pressing workouts, or maybe you're out in the yard with the dog or the kids throwing overhand, and all of a sudden, bam, your shoulder starts to act up. You get a pinch in the front, and you're like, oh crap, what do I do? It's starting to keep you up at night, it's giving you trouble. So you go to your primary care physician, maybe even your chiropractor or your physical therapist that's nearby. And they do their evaluation and they throw out this weird phrase, scapular winging. What? My name is Kyle Waugh and I am a physical therapist assistant, strength and conditioning specialist and certified personal trainer. And I'm here to tell you all about scapular winging, shoulder discomfort, and really define what is happening and give you some exercises to knock this out once and for all. This was precisely my story. I had actually been bench pressing and I started to have some shoulder pain. So I went to my local PT and he started saying, hey, every time you move your shoulder, the scapula is popping off of the rib cage and it's not able to stabilize your shoulder with your heavy lifting. So my PT was right there for me. He started to give me eyes, Ys and T, pet stretches, different rowing and low trap activating exercises. And I did them, I did them nonstop them every day as much as I possibly could because I really wanted to get back to my lifting routine. But by the end of six weeks, I got to the point where these aren't necessarily helping me all that much. My shoulder still bugging me whenever I'm bench pressing. My shoulder was keeping me up at night and good luck if I was to throw a tennis ball for my dog. And to top all this off, now I was just really hyper aware of whatever my shoulder blade was doing. So I was so freaked out that it would pop off with any exercise that I did. Now, I'm not hating on these exercises. It worked really well for a lot of people, but in my case, they just weren't really doing their job. And it wasn't necessarily the exercise's fault. It was more that my body wasn't set up in the right positioning to take full advantage of the work I was doing. So I finally started to dive into textbooks and the real mechanics of how the shoulder works in relation to the shoulder blade and the rib cage, which I had no idea most of this issue that was happening was coming from my rib cage. So what exactly is scapular winging? Well, again, my PT told me that this was the root cause of all of my shoulder problems that I was having at the current time. But when we really dive into exactly what it is, it's just a way that the shoulder's moving. It's a part of being human. There's nothing wrong with the motion at all. And in, in many ways, if you didn't have any winging of the scapula, you probably couldn't move your arm fully overhead. Now, when we really dive into the biomechanics of what's going on, it's when the medial border or the inferior angle of the shoulder blade pops off away from the rib cage. Now, there's two different types of scapular winging. One that's more rare that personally I've never actually seen before is when the shoulder blade is popping off the rib cage and that's due to the long thoracic nerve being impinged or damaged somehow. Now in the research, they say that this really comes from sports injuries, car accidents, things of that nature where that nerve just got messed up some. So what happens is that long thoracic nerve, which innervates the serratus anterior muscle is unable to fully function and if that serratus anterior isn't working properly and getting any neural connection from the brain, then we'll see that shoulder blade just pop right off the rib cage and you're in a pretty rough place. Now that's just the more rare scapular winging case that we'll see. So the secondary reason we're seeing scapular winging is typically due to poor postural positioning or muscles that can't necessarily get leveraged the way they're supposed to. This comes from a poor positioning of your entire body, say if you're leaning forward onto your toes or you're, or you're presenting with that rounded shoulder, forward head and sunken chest posture. Specifically that type of posture, the rounded shoulders, that's going to limit your shoulder internal rotation ability, which is where we'll see scapular winging occur most often. We can bring an analogy to this as wearing a dirty wrinkled shirt versus a versus a t-shirt pulled fresh out of the dryer. When you wear that wrinkled kind of smelly shirt, you pull it out of the bottom of the hamper, put it on and it really doesn't fit too well. It's like wearing a wrinkled up trash bag. It's pretty gross. Whereas when you put that nice t-shirt on fresh out of the dryer, it's a little warm. It's able to move. There's no bunched up areas, wrinkles, no issues at all. So now think of the muscles around your rib cage and around your shoulder blade in the same form or fashion. 
Now I'm not calling your muscles smelly or wrinkled or gross. It's just an analogy. But think of some of these muscles being too tight around the rib cage, and that's gonna prevent the comfortable movement that should occur. So now we're gonna jump into the true biomechanics of how these muscles and bones are acting within scapular winging. Typically, we're gonna see that either one shoulder or both shoulders are biased toward internal rotation, where you'll typically see someone standing and their palms are facing backwards, but you can see the front of their knuckles facing toward you. You'll also see that sunken chest, and if you look on the back, they may have the scapular winging, where that medial border or that inferior angle is popping off the back of the ribcage. Typically, muscles like the pecs will be too tight, subclavius, as well as the pec minor. But we'll also see tight muscles on the back side of the body, like the low traps, the rhomboids, the upper traps, and even in some cases, the serratus anterior can be tight. So think of it as a really tight belt around the upper rib cage, pulling super, super tight underneath the shoulder blades. And that's gonna compress everything together. And then those shoulder blades aren't able to move as well as they could on that surface. So what do they do? They wing, they pop off, they do all kinds of crazy things in order to get the job done of moving your shoulder. So why does scapular winging even matter? Well, like my PT said, all of the shoulder dysfunctions and pain that I was having was due to my scapula popping off the rib cage. So that sounds really scary and it's like, wow, like I have to get this fixed. But in fact, I did all kinds of activities. Like I went around playing basketball, I played baseball, very intense sports probably required some form of scapular stability, right? So why is it that just now I'm having trouble with some of these weightlifting exercises? Is it the lifting itself that's causing the issue? Or is it actually the scapular winging that's the problem? Well, in fact, I don't think either of those are the issues. Instead, it's the lack of shoulder internal rotation that's occurring at said shoulder. So really your scapular winging that's happening isn't the problem, but it's actually a symptom or a compensation around your shoulder not having internal rotation. Now you might be asking, well, Kyle, you just said that previously our shoulders are biased towards internal rotation. Shouldn't you have a lot of internal rotation available? Well, not necessarily. And we can really think of it this way. I can't say, hey, I need to go to my office if I'm already in my office. So if I'm already biased toward internal rotation, that means I probably can't get more internal rotation which is why we will see the compensation or symptom of scapular winging. That scapula pops off of the rib cage in order to create some semblance of more internal rotation that your body just can't get. So without that scapula popping off, you probably wouldn't be able to get your arm fully overhead or fully scratch your back. So yes, scapular winging does matter, but we're looking at it as the problem versus the symptom. Instead, the real problem is just that lack of shoulder internal rotation. But this is a perfect segue into how to test for shoulder internal rotation. Because if you're limiting shoulder internal rotation, you'll probably have scapular winging of some sort. So now we're kind of switching gears and thinking about scapular winging and shoulder internal rotation in the same form or fashion. And we're gonna be testing for both of them at this point in the video. So the first real test or assessment we can do is just standing posture. So what you're gonna do is grab your phone, set it up against a book or have someone film you, walk away from the camera and, you know, just move your shoulder blades around and see what happens. If you're just standing there and you're seeing that there's scapular winging occurring, well, we can probably say with most certainty that you're lacking shoulder internal rotation but let's say you're standing there and there's no scapular winging, but it does occur when you start to move your shoulders around, then you may be lacking some sort of shoulder internal rotation, but we need to really pinpoint when it happens. So that brings up our second test that we'll utilize, which is the Apley's scratch test. Now you'll probably see this test done by both reaching above and below with the arms, like to scratch your back essentially, but in this case, we're only really worried about the internal rotation component of the test. So what you're gonna do is, again, have someone film you or set your phone up, 
take a video and walk away from it. Facing away from the camera, you're going to reach up and try to scratch the opposite shoulder blade. So if I use my right hand, I'm going to reach up and try to scratch my left shoulder blade. Now, I'm going to stop this test if one, I feel any sort of pain or discomfort in the front of the shoulder. If that happens, hey, you're probably lacking some shoulder internal rotation, and you may wanna go get checked out by a local PT just to make sure there's no ligament or tissue damage that has occurred. I'm not saying that to freak you out. Nine times out of 10, there's probably nothing going on and you're just getting some weird impingement type symptoms that these exercises hopefully will help with. But again, I always have to say, make sure you ask your PT or doctor if these exercises are okay. I am just some guy on the internet making videos about shoulder blades. Another time we'll stop this test is when you start to reach up to the opposite shoulder blade and you notice that that inferior angle or medial border of the shoulder blade of the arm that's moving starts to pop off or wing. You stop the test there, you take note of it, you take a screenshot, whatever you gotta do. And then now we have an objective measure as to how much internal rotation you truly have available before you start to compensate or potentially feel some discomfort. Now, if there's anything you get from this video, it's that with whatever intervention you do, I don't care if it's eyes, Y's, T's, pet stretches, whatever you do, just make sure you have a way to test and retest if an exercise helps. So use these tests to really tell you if any intervention you're utilizing is worth your time. Because if you don't have an improvement in your scapular winging or shoulder internal rotation, what are we doing? Now I'm here to tell you, hey, like what actually helped my shoulder blades stick to my rib cage and what actually helped my shoulder. And you probably noticed I talked more about the rib cage than the shoulder blade itself being the primary issue for the lack of internal rotation or scapular winging that's occurring. And the reason why is because, well, we're gonna utilize rib cage expansion or breathing in order to influence the muscles that attaches all around it. So we have two different areas of the body that we really need to send air or really we're thinking pressure into in order to stretch from the inside out. Think of your rib cage as the hill and your shoulder blade and even your head and your neck as like houses on top of it. If I have a rib cage that's all compressed and it's really narrow, well, if the house is sitting on top of it, they're not gonna sit on there very well and they're probably gonna fall off or have some structural issues. But if I have a rib cage or a really nice hill, I guess, that's really wide, I can build all kinds of houses on there. I can have structurally sound architecture, whatever. I, this is why I talk about anatomy and not houses. But hopefully you get what I'm trying to say. We need the rib cage to be able to expand and compress versus just hanging out in a compressed state, tight muscles. And two areas that we need to expand are the anterior chest wall, which we will refer to as the pump handle, and the posterior mediastinum, which is just a fancy word for in between your shoulder blades. So when that pressure hits these areas, they expand and these muscles have to lengthen and really just stretch out which is good, that's what we're looking for because without that, the muscles can't really work right and then your shoulder blades, you gotta pop off the rib cage. I feel like I'm just repeating myself at this point. So now we're gonna dive into more of the exercises to try. First are a series of myofascial release or self-massage techniques that you can use with either a tennis ball, a lacrosse ball, a baseball if you're crazy and just like to hurt yourself. And then the next bit is using the breathing exercises to reposition our rib cage or stretch from the inside out. What this is gonna do is when you start to do the strengthening exercises, series three, it puts your rib cage in a better position so that these muscles can actually do their jobs effectively. And like I said, the third series of exercises is about of strengthening ones. And this wouldn't be a scapular winging video if I didn't talk about the serratus anterior. So a lot of these strengthening exercises will go after the serratus anterior in order to get that sort of glue laminate type effect of, the sh of that shoulder blade up against the rib cage properly. Now, like I said, these are the exercises that help me and I think they will help you, but as always, test and retest make sure that over time, these exercises are actually helping. If you're getting a improvement in your 
aptly scratch test and you're able to reach up further without having any winging or shoulder discomfort, guess what? It's probably the right move for you. But if you did these exercises and they didn't do jack squat or even limited your range of motion, guess what? Don't do them. That's probably not helping you. Or hey, reach out to me and I'll see if I can help you with the execution of these exercises in order to make sure that you're doing them right. So for the first part of the routine, we're gonna focus on more self-myofascial release or self-massage. We're gonna be utilizing a lacrosse ball today, but like I previously stated, you can use a tennis ball, a baseball, whatever you have that can really kind of dig into some of these muscles. Uh, I've got both a doorway that I'll be utilizing and my wall here. So that way I can get to some of these muscles on the back as well as the chest. So for the pecs, we really wanna focus on the pec major, the pec minor, as well as the subclavius, which comes right underneath the collarbone here. So we're just gonna take this lacrosse ball and kind of hit all over them. So I'll put this in the doorway, just like so. You can see the ball. And then I just press into there. I find a gnarly spot and then I just hold, breathe through it. If you want, you can throw some arm movements. So you can see my arm in the background overhead. If you're new to this, take your time, okay? We don't need to do anything too crazy. You don't need to make a bruise. We're really just gonna hold an area for anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute, two minutes max. So now I'm gonna switch over to the pec minor. Find a gnarly spot here. Oop, that was quick. I'm gonna hold it, like I said, 30 seconds to one minute. And we're not really going for changing any fascial position or breaking down tissue. This is more so just to reduce the tone of the muscle. We're trying to change the relationship between the muscle and the brain, so that way it's just not as tight. So now after we've done the pec major and the pec minor, we're gonna go for the subclavius right up in here. Here, I'll even show you all from this angle. And I just find that spot right underneath the collarbone. Now I can go back and forth. If you're having trouble finding the subclavius, really just focus right here at the bottom of that collarbone. You can even just run your fingers in through it. So now that we've reduced some tone through the pec, we're going to target the more posterior aspects of the shoulder blade. So the posterior aspects of the shoulder blade and some of these muscles that'll really give us trouble are the rhomboids, low trap, and upper traps. So we're gonna start with the low trap, located right through here. And then we'll work our way to the rhomboids, located there. After that, we're then going to hit the upper traps. How I'm gonna hit these is I'm just gonna take the ball, place it right here, and then I'm just gonna lean back against the wall. Nothing crazy here, just find a gnarly spot, and I'm tracking right up and down between the shoulder blade. I don't wanna be on the bone itself, so stay off the shoulder blade, stay off the spine. You're not gonna hurt anything, but it's not gonna feel the best, and you're really not gonna get a change. So after I've hit the low trap, I'm then gonna go right between the shoulder blade. I typically find that actually, if I go a little bit lower on it, that I can roll down the wall onto the rhomboids between the shoulder blades. Like I said, I started just below, more of where I was with the low traps. Come down, squat a little bit. Oof, feels good, right? Like I said, we're not trying to break up any knots or anything. We're just reducing some tone. So for the upper trap, we really wanna utilize the doorway again. So in this case, I'm gonna hit my left upper trap. So I'm gonna take that ball right there. This can be pretty intense. So I like to position myself to where tackling the doorway. So I'll put my butt kind of up against this side of the door. Put the ball here at the top, lean over, and right about there, I'm hitting it. You can kind of see it's pinned up against here. Now, there's a lot of nerves through this area. Like I feel this all the way up in my forehead. Comment below if you also feel this up into your forehead and your teeth. Uh, I should probably do this a little more often. When hitting this area, be nice. You don't have to beat yourself up. Again, we're just trying to get some nice fluffy work. So I've hit around the chest. I've hit the shoulder blade, I've hit between the shoulder blades. And now the last little piece I wanna hit is the serratus and the lap. So I know I had mentioned that we're just gonna be using a lacrosse ball for most of these self-massage activities, but to really hit the lat and the serratus as well as you can, a foam roller can work really well. You can also use a towel, just lay it on the floor, rolled up, and you can kind of get the same effect. But, so we're gonna hit the lat with this, and we can kind of hit these in all, like one big sweep. Think here to here and we can roll over the two of them so i'm going to lay on my side on the lat and i'm just going to rotate forward and backwards you'll feel it kind of bounce around Ooh, like that feels really good this is more lat right now so i'm focusing on more like the lateral 
posterior portion of the rib cage. Now, if I went serratus, I just go more forward. So you'll see, I'll just roll forward. Oh, up and down, side to side. Find the worst spot you can, breathe into it. Really with the serratus, we want to utilize the breath to sort of expand into these structures. So you're trying to get those ribs to like pop out and like get in between each one with your breath. So that's it for the self-massage routine. Now we're really gonna focus on the repositioning exercises to get that rib cage expansion. All these muscles are nice, they're full of blood now, we got things moving. So the repositioning should take a bit more and we can get that expansion from the inside out. The first exercise we'll be utilizing in the repositioning drills is a seated banded posterior expansion. We'll need a really light band, think yellow or peach, and that will be between the hands. And then you wanna do a couple of scapular retractions and protractions, holding the protracted position. The elbows are below shoulder level, so at about 45 degrees or so. Now, what we'll do with this is we will fully exhale everything out while maintaining that scapular protraction. And as you exhale, you should feel some lower abdominals kick in. Hold your breath for five seconds at the end of that exhale, and then silently inhale through the nose while keeping the lower abdominals taut. Inhale and feel this expansion through the rib cage in 360 degrees, specifically into the posterior aspect between the shoulder blades. We're trying to expand the rib cage backwards in between the shoulder blades so that way the scapula can sit nice and even on the rib cage. Now common mistakes we'll see with this exercise are overstretching the band where it's way too taut and tucking the chin underneath. We'll also see folks want to really round their back in like a turtle shell through that thoracic spine. And lastly, we want to watch out for inhaling and utilizing the upper traps. So you'll inhale and shrug the shoulders up versus being able to inhale and send that breath 360 degrees through the rib cage. The second exercise we'll use in this repositioning series is the bear position breathing. So you'll start with a foam roller between your knees and in a quadruped position with the knees directly underneath the hips and hands directly underneath the shoulders. We'll do a couple of scapular retractions and protractions while maintaining the protracted state. You'll then lean forward to put a little bit more weight through the upper body and through the hands and make sure that you're keeping the elbows nice and soft. You don't want to lock them out and be in a hyper extended position. You'll then maintain this positioning while completing the breathing. So you'll fully exhale everything out, feeling a little bit of lower abdominal tension. You'll then hold for five seconds and then silently inhale through the nose while maintaining that abdominal tension. You should feel some inhalation or expansion into the anterior chest wall, as well as a bit into the posterior aspect in between those shoulder blades. Some common mistakes we'll see with this positioning is we'll hold too much of a lower dotted curvature in the low back to where that back is really just swaying down, which will prevent proper abdominal contraction on your exhalation. And then we'll also see the opposite where people will try to make that turtle shell through the thoracic spine, just getting way too much flexion through that area. You may feel sufficient abdominals with this, but at sacrificing the anterior expansion that should happen. We also wanna watch out for leaning too far back in which the hips and shoulders are behind the knees and the hands and also again rounding through that mid spine just a bit too much and the most important part of this is maintaining that scapular protraction throughout the breathing this position isn't too difficult but you may want to video yourself as you can see here this used to be way worse but maintaining that protracted position with the shoulder blades laminated or glued down to the rib cage it's pretty tough and you can see how that left side wants to pop out a little bit more than the right so be sure that you're maintaining that positioning but without too much excessive pec activation, as that pec activation will limit the anterior expansion that should happen. For the last repositioning exercise, we'll be utilizing a door for the supported squat hold. Now you don't have to necessarily use a door, but the most important thing is that you need something to hold on to with your palms facing up. So we'll also be utilizing a foam roller or a yoga block between the knees. And then what you're going to do is squat down to between 45 and 60 degrees of hip flexion. Now you'll also maintain shoulder flexion of about 45 to 60 degrees as well. As you can see, my arm is parallel to to my thigh. So I'm gonna make sure my weight is in my heels as I'm hanging backwards off the door in this case. So that way I feel a gentle stretch between the shoulder blades. I'm not necessarily squeezing the foam roller, I'm just holding it in place 
and then I will fully exhale everything out, feel some low abdominal tension. I'll maintain that tension through a five second pause. And on the inhalation, where I will feel a gentle expansion through the posterior portion of the rib cage, as well as a little bit into the anterior portion. Common mistakes we'll see with this exercise are really over rounding. And you'll see that turtle shell shape again in the thoracic spine. And you'll get some abdominal tension with this, but again, it's going to limit the anterior chest wall expansion. We'll also see pushing the knees way too far forward and leaning upper back too far backwards. We'll also see folks will try to squeeze their shoulder blades together in this position when we're actually trying to get some space through there and let that relax. And now we're on to the third series of exercises, the strengthening exercises. We'll be utilizing some different things like a chair, some yoga blocks, but really all of these movements can be done at home and at your own level of strength. So we'll try to modify it as best as we can if you're having some trouble with these. Here we're going to really target the serratus anterior muscle with some seated wall slides. You've probably seen these before or even tried them if you've done PT, but we're going to change it up a little bit and put you down in a chair with your knees up against the wall. You're then going to have your elbows against the wall, thumbs out, so palms are facing toward you. You'll do a couple of scapular protraction and retractions while maintaining the protracted position. While you have everything locked in place, you're going to then gently slide your forearms with your elbows still touching the wall up and down in a controlled manner. We're not going too far as to extend through the back or lose our stack position of the low ribs down and over the pelvis. Now you can put your hands in whatever position you feel like. I personally like to do this with the palms facing toward me as this will keep the lat muscles from being overactive in this position. So that way you get more of the serratus anterior and to be sure that you're hitting the serratus, you should feel a light burn through the area on the side of the rib cage, just below the armpits. And we will complete three rounds of 10 to 20 reps of this exercise. Some common mistakes we'll see with this seated wall slide is extending too much with the low back. So as you're going into shoulder flexion, you'll see a lot of people use their low back muscles to posteriorly orient the rib cage as a whole in order to get that shoulder flexion to happen. Our goal with this activity is to keep the rib cage in place over the pelvis so that way we can get the true shoulder flexion to occur and get the scapular upward rotation utilized by the serratus anterior. Another common mistake we'll see with this is shrug Hugging the shoulders up and utilizing more of the upper traps rather than the serratus interior itself. If this is occurring, you just may need to reduce the range of motion that you're trying to utilize in order to make sure you really have that serratus anterior working well. The next exercise in the series is the rough country bear crawls. You're gonna need some books, yoga blocks, really whatever you have, and they can be of varying heights. And what you're going to do is assume that bear position that we practiced earlier, but with the knees off the ground. Now what you'll do is just walk over top of the books or the yoga blocks in varying fashions from side to side, forward, backwards, uh, diagonals, really whatever you wanna do. We'll be completing this for a timed effort, so 30 seconds to one minute, or really whatever you can tolerate. We're utilizing this exercise to again strengthen the serratus anterior while also learning how to maintain the positions that we previously utilized in the repositioning series. The varying heights and directions utilizes different parts of the serratus muscle as well as building a more reflexive nature at the shoulder joint, which is utilized for more dynamic activities. And as a positive byproduct, you get a really good core workout out of this exercise. So some common mistakes we'll see with this exercise is as you're doing the crawling, you'll keep your knees too high off the ground and your butt is over your head. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it will tax your shoulders a little bit faster and you may not feel as much core engaging. We'll also see people want to do this with their back pretty extended and sinking down into the shoulders. And in this circumstance, they're really just using their low back to stabilize versus their abdominal muscles and serratus anterior. We'll also see people over utilizing the pecs and the anterior chest wall muscles in order to stabilize when they round their back a little too much. Now, if you're really struggling with this exercise and you just feel like you don't have enough strength, one thing you can do is just progress the bare repositioning exercise we did earlier in the series and just lift the knees up and treat this more as a plank. You can then build up strength, say doing three rounds of 30 to 60 second holds while breathing all the way out and all the way in in the same fashion as the repositioning. And this should help you build up the strength required to do more of the rough country bear crawls. For our last strengthening exercise of the series, 
We will be using a bench and one yoga block or some books. Now you'll set yourself up in pseudo bear position with your knees slightly bent and you're at about say 20 to 40 degrees of hip flexion. Now you'll set up like you're gonna do a normal push up, but you're going to have one hand on the book or the block, whereas the other hand is flat on the bench. You'll then lower yourself down toward the bench and press away. And as you press away, you're really gonna push through the book or the block in order to get the opposite hand off the bench. This is another exercise that's really good for strengthening that serratus anterior while simultaneously strengthening the pet muscles. And I really like this because it strengthens one side at a time and makes this more of a unilateral exercise for that serratus anterior, which is especially helpful if you have say one shoulder that weans out more than the other. Now a really simple way to progress this incline version is just to take it down to the floor. But what you'll see is that this is very, very difficult to maintain that scapular position, especially on the downward phase of the bear push-up. So personally, I would be sticking to the incline variation until that shoulder blade was sticking a little bit better, but it doesn't mean I can't do this variation if I'm just going for some push-up and pet strength that I wanted to get. And again, the setup and execution is exactly the same as the incline variation, just without a bench or hands on a coffee table. Lastly, you would want to complete three sets of 10 to 15 reps of either the incline or the floor variation of these push-ups in order to get the appropriate stimulus for strengthening these scapular muscles. Typically you'll see most of these common mistakes pop up in the floor variation of the offset push-up, but the biggest one we'll see is just extending through that low back and stabilizing with the spinal erector muscles versus keeping the knees slightly bent and able to maintain that position of the rib cage versus the pelvis to keep that abdominal tension working. So if you made it to this part of the video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching my content as I'll be posting more videos to come on, on different postural issues as well as just general strength training and rehabilitation practices. I'll also invite you to check out the blog post on my website at wallpersonaltraining.com where there will be a full written out version of this video where you can follow along and do some of the exercises and sign up for a free 20 minute posture and movement assessment.